In this lecture, we are going to introduce ray tracing, which is really one of the most significant developments in the history of computer graphics. First, let's consider the effects we need to create realistic images. One effect is shadows, and often we want to be able to consider the shadows from an area light source or diffuse lighting, in which case you get soft shadows with penumbras. We want to be able to handle reflections from mirrors and glossy surfaces. We want to be able to handle transparency from water and glass. And we want to be able to handle one surface reflecting on another. This is an effect known as color bleeding, where if you have a white surface next to a red wall, the white surface will develop a reddish tinge because of reflections from the red wall. Complex illumination, such as what you would find naturally in the outdoors, what you would find indoors with many complex light sources, as well as realistic material, velvets, paints, glass. Most of these effects are possible, but very difficult to do using the OpenGL pipeline that we've studied so far. Ray tracing is a different approach to image synthesis as compared to the standard rasterization pipeline in OpenGL. We go pixel by pixel instead of object by object. If you think about what a rasterizer does, it takes each object, determines which pixels on the screen that object corresponds to, and then acts accordingly. A ray tracer goes pixel by pixel. For each pixel, it finds the closest object and shades it appropriately. One of the advantages of ray tracing is that it is easy to compute things like shadows, transparency, which are very difficult to do in OpenGL, there are ways in which you can create shadows, you can create reflections. In fact, many video games have them. However, they are much easier to do in ray tracing, and there are many effects in ray tracing that come for free or are very difficult to create with the hardware pipeline. We'll start with a brief history of ray tracing. Then we'll talk about basic ray casting, how this differs from rasterization. We'll talk about shadows and reflections, which are the core algorithm, and ray surface intersection. Finally, we'll discuss a few optimizations. Ray tracing goes back more than 40 years, but really the landmark paper in this area is by Turner Witted in 1980, which introduced the notion of recursive ray tracing. In fact, homework three will be to develop a recursive ray tracer. Subsequently, there was lots of work on various geometric primitives, so you could have general scenes with a variety of different geometric objects, as well as lots of works on different acceleration structures to make ray tracing fast. Ray tracing is a historically slow process, but in recent years we've seen it come into real time and also have graphics hardware support. Just to say a couple of words about current research, ray tracing has now entered the mainstream as a real-time technique. NVIDIA's optics includes now a real-time ray tracer. There has been a lot of work on architectures for real-time ray tracing, and we're seeing more and more that ray tracing is being used in addition to the standard OpenGL rasterization. The history of ray tracing, or the modern history, begins with this seminal paper by Turner Witted in 1980, an improved illumination model for shaded display. The image shown here is the canonical initial ray tracing image that Turner Witted created. It seems pretty simple with today's hindsight, but it contains just a sphere and a checkerboard. The important thing is the reflections of the checkerboard and the sphere, the refractions of the checkerboard through the bubble. These were visual effects that were stunning when they came out in 1980, when all you've been used to seeing is standard diffuse and form shaded images of simple scenes in OpenGL. These images were rendered at 512 by 512 on a wax of those days, and at that time it took an hour and 14 minutes. Today in software, if you write Homework 3 and you write this ray tracer, it should be a good deal faster than an hour and 14 minutes. If you plug it into the NVIDIA Optics ray tracer, you will actually be able to do this scene in real time. Here's the outline of how ray tracing works the outline in the code. Start with high level this ray trace function. Note the inputs to the ray trace function. We have the camera, you have the scene, the width and the height of the image. So these are image width and heights. So you create a new image with the appropriate width and height. 
and then you go through each pixel. So these loops correspond to pixels. Ray tracing, remember, goes to each pixel and figures out what it should do at that pixel. In contrast, rasterization goes to each object and figures out what it should do at that object. R create the ray through the pixel, find where the ray intersects the scene, and then color the hit point. This is a very simple algorithm, and it doesn't get very much more complicated as you add the basic functionality of recursive ray tracing. The devil is, of course, in the detail, but because of the conceptual simplicity of a ray tracer, it's become a very popular manifestation to create 3D computer graphics. The first part of the algorithm we'll discuss is basic ray casting. In this case, we'll produce essentially the same images that you could do with OpenGL, so just using ray casting to resolve visibility and depth instead of rasterization. The visibility in this case is per pixel. You do one pixel at a time instead of using a Z buffer. You find the nearest object by shooting rays into the scene, and then you shade it as an OpenGL. Let's consider the differences between rasterization and ray tracing for a moment. So let's call this ray tracing and let's call this rasterization. In ray tracing, you say you first go over the pixels, and so it's really a for loop over the pixels, and then you go over each object. Now, of course, you don't a priori know which objects correspond to which pixels, therefore you have to really loop over all of the objects, although we'll see later with acceleration structures this can be made very much more efficient. In rasterization, you first go to all of the objects in the scene, and then for each of these objects, you see which pixels you need to consider. But you don't need to consider all the pixels, you only need to consider those corresponding to the object. So these are the pixels which are actually in the object. Here we see a priori why ray tracing has historically been slow you need to consider all pixels and all objects, so the cost is the number of pixels times the number of objects, whereas in rasterization you still pay the cost of the number of objects, but the number of pixels is just the number of pixels a given object covers, which could be 10 or 20. In modern systems, very often an object may cover less than a pixel, so you may just have an object covering one or two pixels. Therefore, ray tracing has historically been a very slow process, However, there are things like acceleration structures, which mean that you don't need to consider all of the objects in the scene. And in today's complicated scenes where you may have billions of objects but only millions of pixels, the fact that you can discard many of the objects, you may never hit them in the ray tracer, can actually give you a benefit for visualizing large models over rasterization. Let's now talk about the basic ray casting algorithm. The diagram I've shown here includes a virtual viewpoint corresponding to the camera, your screen, and some objects. What I'm going to do is trace a ray or cast a ray for visibility from the virtual viewpoint and see what objects it hits. In this case, the ray misses all of the objects, therefore the pixel will be colored black. Let's look at what happens at the next pixel. In this case, the ray hits this object, the cylinder, and therefore it will be shaded using the hit point, the color of the object, the reflectance properties of the object, the lights, and the materials. For now, assume it's shaded exactly the same way as in Homework 2, as is done in OpenGL. So we've assigned a color to that pixel. Consider the next ray. In this case, there are two hit points. It first hits the cylinder, and then it hits the ground. For multiple intersections, you use the closest one to the camera, as does the Z-buffer algorithm in OpenGL, and you shade it accordingly. So far, the images that you will produce will be exactly the same as you will with a rasterizer in OpenGL. However, the algorithm is conceptually different because it goes to each pixel, shoots a ray, and finds the closest object rather than rasterizing objects and maintaining a z-buffer for each pixel. Let's summarize the comparison to the hardware scanline algorithm, also the rasterization algorithm. You evaluate rays per pixel, and on the face of this, it is costly. 
But as we mentioned earlier, with good acceleration structures, it can actually give you a win for walkthroughs of extremely large models. Perhaps most importantly, ray tracing enables a number of complex lighting and shading effects, which we'll talk about next.